Having considered gene expression now and the effects of mutations on the uh, functioning of gene products, it's time to move on to regulation of gene expression. And th this is the ability of organisms, regulating gene expression is the ability of organisms to turn genes on or off as required. Uh, simple case, uh, you can imagine that neurons in a mammalian brain, for example, do not need to turn on genes that are required for kidney cell function, for example. They should turn those kidney um, genes off uh, so as not to waste energy in the manufacture of gene products that aren't required for neuronal function, and vice versa for kidney cells, as an example. Kidney cells would not want to express neuronal specific genes uh, because they don't function as neurons, so it would be a waste of energy to invest in the manufacture of neuron specific gene products if um, you are a kidney cell. And the, the same holds for bacteria and prokaryotes. If a bacterium has available to it a uh, food source, a sugar source, then it makes sense to turn on genes that are going to uh, enable the bacterium to utilize that food source, to break it down, to provide energy. However, if, there, if that food source is not around, it would be wasteful for the bacterial cell to manufacture the gene products required for the breakdown of that food stuff if, the, if that food stuff is not available. So it makes sense energetically for organisms to regulate gene expression, to turn genes on and off, to throw genetic switches, if you will, on and off. And so um, we're going to start our discussion uh, by recalling our general central dogma processes of, G of DNA being replicated DNA being transcribed into RNA messages, and RNA, in most cases, for protein coding genes anyway, being translated into proteins. Proteins kind of serving as the hardware of the cell, and DNA and RNA as serving as the software information of the cell. Now, it is true that there are functional RNAs that are not translated into protein, but um, considering the general protein coding genes, this is the scheme of the central dogma. And let's start our discussion then of the regulation of gene expression then, the production of gene products by DNA. Um, let's start our discussion of the regulation of that gene expression process uh, by looking at some prokaryotic uh, operon regulations. And you may recall that we, in bacterial operons, if we look at um, operons, those operons can encode gene products that are utilized in biochemical pathways. And in general, we have two types of biochemical pathways. We have catabolic biochemical pathways in which a um, compound, a food source usually, let's, let's call it a sugar, is broken down in a series of steps that um, convert sugar to compound A to B to C and generally break down that sugar with the net yield of energy. Um, so the breakdown of foodstuffs and catabolic pathways, biochemical pathways, yield energy. Now naturally there's going to be some input of energy into this process as well. For example, the enzymes, enzyme 1 here, enzyme 2, enzyme 3, and enzyme 4 that are needed to um, degrade the foodstuff, the sugar, um, the production of those enzymes requires an input of energy and as well the glycolytic pathway itself and the breakdown of glucose requires an initial input of energy as well. But right now we're concerned with the energy that is required in order to manufacture the enzymes that can break down this food stuff. So energetically speaking now from a designer's standpoint, if you have a particular sugar, a particular food stuff, and that is plentiful, then it makes sense to manufacture the gene products the enzymes that will be used, the enzymes and proteins that will be used in the breakdown of that sugar uh, to provide energy for the cell. Um, it makes sense to, to, to do that, energetically speaking. However, if the sugar is at low concentrations or absent from the bacterial environment, it would be silly to put energy into the production of the proteins required for the derivation of energy fr from that sugar if that sugar is not around. So, uh, bacteria then would have um, a, 
an, an interest in regulating the genes that encode enzymes involved in the catabolism of particular foodstuffs, turning the genes for those enzymes or proteins on when the sugar is around and turning them off when the sugar is not around. On, in anabolic pathways, however, you'll remember that here we are talking about the building up of a product that can be used by the cell. So we might convert compound A to compound B to compound C, compound D to some product, for example, an amino acid or some other product that is useful to the cell. And this requires, as we know, an input of energy. Energy is input into this, not only in um, uh, the requirement of ATP for individual steps here, but also in the manufacture of enzymes. Here's enzyme 1, enzyme 2, enzyme 3, and enzyme 4. So energy is required in anabolic pathways to synthesize a particular product that will be useful to the cell. And part of the, the energy investment is in the manufacture of the gene products that are required to run the biochemical pathway that will produce that product. Now, in converse to catabolic pathways, if you have a lot of the product around, it seems silly, it would seem silly energetically from a designer's point of view to invest in e energy in manufacturing the gene products, enzymes that are involved in, the man in running the biochemical pathway to synthesize that product because the cell already has product around. Um, it would behoove the bacterial cell then to turn off the genes that manufacture these enzymes because there's already plenty of product around. However, if the product is at low concentrations or is absent, very, very low concentrations are absent in the cell, then the cell needs that product and it would behoove the bacterial cell to turn on, to regulate genes in a positive fashion, to turn on the genes that encode these various enzymes so that the product can be manufactured in this particular biochemical pathway. So we will look at both the regulation of catabolic operons and the regulation of anabolic operons in bacteria, starting with catabolic operons. So here is um, lactose, a disaccharide. It's, there are two, two single sugars here involved in this disaccharide. And one of the first steps in the breakdown of this sugar to derive energy for the cell is the cleavage of lactose in, by the enzyme beta-galactosidase into glucose and galactose. And um, <coughs> galactose will need to be processed eventually to glucose in order to enter the glycolytic pathway. But one half of this reaction, or one, one half of the products of this reaction, glucose can enter the glycolytic pathway. And this first step is catalyzed by the enzyme beta-galactosidase which is encoded by the LAC-Z gene. Now the LAC-Z gene is one of three main genes in the lactose operon of bacteria. And so let's look at the regulation of that operon. And first we're going to look at the model for the regulation of the lactose operon, which yeah, encodes proteins responsible for the utilization of this food source, of this lactose sugar. And then we will look at, in some detail, the experiments of Jacob and Minot, which um, Nobel Prize winning experiments, which revealed to us the mechanism of the genetic switch for turning on the operon when lactose is present and turning off the operon when lactose is absent. And uh, this will become clear as we go through this. So here is the model for regulation of the lactose operon at, in an in introductory level and we'll, we'll consider some more advanced regulation uh, in, in a little while. But we know that operons are regulated by, um, by a regulatory sequence that lies upstream of the transcription start site for the mRNA. And we also know, we've also studied uh, the fact that there are polycystronic messages in prokaryotes, in bacteria, such that a single messenger RNA can encode multiple proteins by subsequent translation of the um, different uh, genes in the polycystronic or multiple gened mRNA. In this case, the LAC-Z gene of the LAC operon encodes beta-galactosidase. The LAC-Y gene encodes a permease, which is involved in uh, bringing lactose into the cell 
And then finally, there is the lac aging, which encodes an acetylase, uh, also uh, utilizing the enzymatic uh, utilization of lactose as a food source. We don't need to go into the activity of, of that enzyme specifically. But here we see that uh, coordinate regulation of these genes makes sense in an operon um, model because um, bacteria then can turn on the, the genes that encode proteins that are involved in a common biochemical pathway, in this case the utilization of lactose as a food source. Now, RNA polymerase, as we know, binds to the promoter region of an operon and so will transcribe that operon under certain circumstances. But the operon is regulated by a protein called the repressor protein. And the repressor protein is the product of, it's the protein product of a LAC I gene, which it encodes the LAC repressor. And the LAC I gene is transcribed at some constant level in bacterial cells so that there is always some repressor present in the cell, the LAC operon repressor. And the LAC operon repressor protein is a DNA binding protein. It binds to operator DNA, and the operator DNA sequence lies between the promoter where RNA polymerase binds and the transcription start site. So if repressor is bound on the operator, the RNA polymerase is occluded from transcri transcribing the operon. That is, it, it does not have the ability to initiate transcription of the operon, and therefore none of the gene products of the operon will be made when repressor protein is bound to the operator. Now let's think back to our, our pathway, our biochemical pathway, and consider that under and consider the circumstances under which we would want this situation to exist, where we would want to turn off transcription of the operon by binding of repressor to operator DNA. And that situation would be when there was no lactose around to degrade. Why invest the energy in pr producing the gene products of the operon if there is no lactose available to be broken down and utilized by the products of the operon. Energetically speaking, um, that would, it would not be a smart idea for the cell to go ahead and, and invest the energy required for transcription, required for translation of the mRNA into protein products, if there's no use for those protein products because there's no lactose around. So this would be the default situation of the operon. It would be off when lactose is unavailable to the cell. However, if lactose becomes available to the cell, then it would behoove the cell to turn on the operon because then the gene products of the operon could be utilized to derive energy from the lactose food source. And lactose itself, the sugar lactose, the disaccharide lactose, actually binds to an allosteric binding site on the repressor. Not the DNA binding site, which binds to operator DNA, but an allosteric site. And that causes a conformational change in the repressor, which causes the repressor to lose affinity for the nucleotide sequence of the operator for which it is specific. And under those circumstances, when lactose is around and bound, therefore, to the allosteric binding site of the repressor, the repressor falls off the operator, and RNA polymerase is free to transcribe the operon, and the translation machinery of the cell will produce the gene products of the operon that can then utilize the lactose that is present. So in this case, the lactose molecule itself, the food source that is going to be broken down by the products of the operon, the food source itself acts as an inducer of operon transcription, that is, it acts as an inducer of gene expression of the genes of the operon. So lactose is an inducer, and it induces transcription of the operon by causing the repressor to fall off of operator DNA. So let's look at that at the molecular level very briefly before uh, progressing to the data which uh, yielded this model for operon regulation, in this case, regulation of an operon that is catabolic in nature, that is involved in the breakdown of the food source lactose. We'll pick up there in the next part of this lecture, which deals then with the structure of the repressor in, in binding operator, and then moving on to the data underlying this model.